Hey guys, how's it going? It's me, Josh Halter, owner and founder of The Bio Dude. I am here at The Bio Dude Houston. You can come visit uh, us at our shop Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Check out my website, thebiodude.com. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you know, the whole gig. And today, in, betwe in between the two palms, I have a very special guest that I've been really looking forward to hosting, and that is Mariah Healy, owner of Reptophiles. And I'm so excited to have her because she is becoming a really valuable asset here in our community. I'm really excited to, you know, to talk with her about some of the things that she's been doing, uh, what some of her goals are for the hobby, and, you know, just to talk reptiles. And I'm really excited to have you. Yeah. So, you know, Mariah, tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Why did you start Reptophiles? You know, what, what made you want to own a reptile business? Fill me in. Okay, so... Reptophiles, you'd think that something like Reptophiles, where it's all about better reptile care and really focusing on the welfare aspect of husbandry, whereas most people focus on the breeding, you'd think that I would have started as like some militant animal welfare person. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> it's really been a gradual process where instead of like falling into the pond, I've just like gradually slipped down a muddy slope. Uh, That's how the hobby starts. Basically, yeah. Uh, it started when I got my first couple of bearded dragons. Um, made a lot of beginner mistakes there, as you can imagine. And um, I love to research. I've always loved to research. And then I would like write up little papers with what I had found and like give them to my parents and be like, be so proud of me. I researched a thing. I did this, I did this for a little all kinds of lizards, like anoles, betta fish. I even like made my own magazine for my pet turtle when I was a teenager. It was That's ridiculous. Cool. Yeah, I wasted so much printer ink. <laughs> I don't know how my parents put up with it. Then again, they got rid of the turtle a year later, so there you go. Um, That's the answer to the problem. Sorry. <laughs> is not. <laughs> but um, so when I finally like became an adult, I'm like, yay, I can have lizards, and my parents aren't going to like get rid of them, and I actually have the resources and the time and the know-how to do this right. So I started out and I wanted to put my research on how to care for bearded dragons somewhere uh, so that I could just access it easily. And if anyone wanted to see it, they could find it too. So I had a little personal blog at the time that was really just a sandbox site because I work in digital marketing. And so that was something that the company I worked for did for their employees was here's a little sandbox site go nuts and so i did and that's how i learned uh, a lot about building and maintaining a website but i just plopped it there and over time as i accumulated more reptiles because you know that first year of that the hobby is, is exponential yeah. um i decided to keep keep putting information on there and realized hey i really like doing this so it's just, it just kind of happened from there where I've been putting up more care guides and doing more research and along the way, follow, along the way falling deeper and deeper in love with reptile husbandry, not as like a bare minimum thing, but as an all in nature ref replication process. Like, you know, nurturing the wild, the wild aspect of the animals, not mm -hmm. Yes, really prioritizing. Yeah, really prioritizing the the animal and not prioritizing human convenience. I think exotic animal care has really, um, for some reason, it and pets in general. If we really think about it, it's all about the human convenience. It's like how can we make your life easier? But we're not talking about how we can make your animals' lives better. How can we help them live longer? How can we help them live healthier? And when you have a hobby where veterinarians are still fairly rare and may not always have the most expertise on an animal, because exotic animal veterinarians specifically are so spread thin, you really need to care well for them. Oh, you're absolutely right. Because if you look at the United States, the number of board certified restaurant amphibian veterinarians is not very many. It's slim. Yep. And it makes it really challenging, like, especially if you have a sick reptile, if you want to go to the vet and, you know, you want to be able to get something done, it just makes it even that much harder to know that, am I getting the right advice? Am I getting 
just, you know, incorrect, you know, husbandry information just because of an outdated book mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that, that you don't know any better. So this all started from Ethan Geary's, is, is what Yep, we're yeah, very, very common start. Yep. And I remember, I remember my first Geary. So, you know, you talked about, um, you know, after you started get, typing, uh, typing up on your little sandbox website and stuff, you know, what is what was your favorite way to you know you said you, you like to research so mm -hmm. when you research like what platforms do you like to use do you like to go off of like college papers do you like to go off like experience tell me a little bit about how you access your viable accurate information to give people like me people like my viewers mm -hmm. good solid content and accurate information that's a really good question and it really depends okay. because for some species, they're really common. There's a ton of information out there about them. And other species are really uncommon. And so it's hard to find anything about them and requires a lot more extrapolation. So say um, my current project is red-eared sliders and kind of just uh, Trichemus scripta in general, pond sliders. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of information on the internet about them. Um, and that's my primary resource. I try to use physical books when I can. I prefer that, but they more easily come out of date. And it's just a necessary evil there. But I've been reminded of the difficulty of just, here are a lot of resources. Everything from Facebook groups to, uh, to just your average Joe website in the middle of nowhere, some, some random person's blog that they're passionate about, their pet turtle named Squid. Like, it's, there's an incredible amount of information. So what I have to do is, with that, I have to just dive right in and read everything until I'm so sick of it, need to take a break, dive in again, take a break, dive in again, just go through and start waiting to see the patterns form. Mm -hmm. it, makes, it makes perfect sense. So, you know, obviously accurate, up-to-date information is a big priority for you. Would you say, like, when you take reptophiles as a whole, you know, right now, what's, what is it that you want to, you, what do you want to accomplish? So, like, so obviously you want to be able to spread accurate information, be able to get it, you know, you know, like say, where better reptile, where better reptile care begins. You know, so where do you see reptophiles a year from now? Where do you see reptophiles three years from now? And, you know, what do you want to get from that? You know, okay. not on a personal, but as like a, as an extrinsic value of what you're doing. Right. So I've always been horrible with keeping five-year plans. Um, <laughs> life just, you never know where it's going to take you. So I try to go with the flow a little bit and just accept where it takes me and kind of guide it in the general direction rather than trying to like force life into this very rigid mold of how I want to live and be. Yep. Uh, and I've, I'm happier for it for sure. But um, concerning reptile, reptophiles, I want to keep it growing. I want more care guides and I, I'm going to be expanding onto YouTube myself soon. Uh, that's a very daunting endeavor. I'm terrified. People are savages. <laughs> it's not so much the comments as the sheer amount of work that goes into producing and formatting a video. Yeah. I'm like, I could be spending this time on care guides. But it's really Im important because a lot of people aren't inclined to reading. That's not their learning style. Yep. So I have to provide other methods as well. So I've recently started uh, putting... Uh, my blog posts in an audio format. I'll just record myself reading it and then someone can listen to it if they'd rather not read. Um, and then... That's a really good idea. I've never thought about yeah. that. Like an, audio, an audio care sheet. Yeah, I haven't done that for the care sheets yet, but that's definitely a project in the future. Might be doing that around the same time as I do, and, uh, as I break down the care guides into uh, YouTube video segments. Still seeing how that will work out. So that's the, the short term. The long term is I want to make reptophiles my full-time gig. So I, I want to be able to leave my full-time job. It's a good job, but I want to be able to devote myself completely to reptile husbandry research where 
it's not it may not be as deep as you know what the PhDs are doing but it's bringing information to the people who need it most in a way that they can understand that that last sentence in a way that we can understand you know that's something that I try to work like I try to work and other people who are doing something similar to you know that I'm doing what you're doing it's all about putting information in a clear concise way because there's so much information available to everyone. Like we mm -hmm. just said, like the Facebook group, you have people that have been doing it for three months that know more than somebody's been doing it for 25 years, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really important to be able that when we dictate our recommendations or X, Y, and Z, that we are not only confident, but they've put into a way that, you know, that they don't feel like they have to go into some groups that may be agenda-led or informations that, you know, that, you know, push the wrong idealization, mm -hmm. you know, of, you know, of specific ways to keep reptiles. Like, a lot of people, like, reptiles don't need UVB. I had a guy tell me that, that, uh, that UVB can cause blindness and leopard geckos. And I uh. looked at it, and I was like, you know what, maybe you, you should take a look at the sun and see if it blinds you. You know, it's, 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 just, it's just one of those things, like, there's that misinformation out there mm -hmm. that sometimes just, it, it belays the common sense of how it even becomes a thing. And I think that's what attracts me so much about what you're doing, is because you have the gift of putting it into a way in, in words that people can understand, that's easy to read, and I, I can't do that to save my life. I can talk, <laughs> everyone knows that, but I think that's, I think, I think that's, I think that's really awesome. I'm glad that my word vomit makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it, the folklore husbandry phenomenon is really something like, and that's why I, when I do my research, I look at the animal's natural habitat. I'm like, okay, what are groups saying? What are people saying? Self-proclaimed experts, breeders, all of these different sources, what are they saying? And how well does that fit compared to how the animal is living in the wild? And I'm not talking about the negative factors of their natural environment either, because there are some things we don't want to replicate, you know, disease, starvation, drought, you name it. But there are a lot of good things too that shaped over the course of literally millions of years, the animals that they are today. Yeah, the little e evolutionary niches that mm -hmm. makes them all so unique in the first place. Is what I like to tell my customers is when they come in here, like, you know, they'll go, bio, dude, why should I spend this? Well, why should I go bio, you know, or why, you know, why is this better? And my response is almost always the same. I say, well, I want you to think of it this way. The whole point of keeping a reptile as a pet is because of how cool and unique it is. If you aren't going to nurture what makes it so unique as a species to get to see in front of you what makes it so unique as a species if you just want it as a, as a commodity you shouldn't have it but if you're willing to you know to put that time research or whatever into understanding them as a whole and nurturing those instincts and niches and things like that that's what makes them so freaking cool like the emeralds that we got yeah. in the and alpha layers i mean i see so many different behaviors that if I was keeping them on pile, or if I was keeping them on, um, yeah, I my language here, something different, um, I don't think I'd get those behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that's, I think that's something that is starting to really change in our hobby, um, especially for the better. And then, you know, unfortunately, we have other aspects of things that are, that kind of, that can regress in mm -hmm. the hobby. You know, yeah. and is there anything like with reptophiles specifically? that some part of the hobby, you know, which we'll get into in another video, but briefly touch it, something that bothers you, but something that really, that you just like, you know, just come on, man, you know, mm -hmm. type of thing, you know, and that you want to get that information out there to like, let us know, like, this is why it should be done the way that mm -hmm. it is. Is there anything that immediately comes to mind for you with that? Man, there's I know so it's much. Loaded, <laughs> so many, there's a loaded question, a loaded question. Oh, uh, yeah, I think, What's been on the top of my mind lately is that people think, so yeah, let's go, let's go with this one. They, they misunderstand the data that is presented to them. So they have an agenda. They want to understand it one way and they will try to take the data that is given to them and warp it to fit their agenda or their worldview. Yeah. I mean, we see this everywhere, but 
it's in the reptile hobby. It's one of the reasons why we see folklore husbandry developing. It is like that one. <laughs> That's a great I have no. I think uh, it first uh, was coined when uh, I did that podcast with animals at home. I think that's what he called I did, it. I, I, I did one with Dylan too. He played up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really he enjoyed it, and he's been great to work with ever since. But yeah, so folklore husbandry. We'll say that he came up with it. <laughs> um, a lot of it is not. It, it's not malicious. It comes from people who are doing their best but they are so they misunderstand and they just fall off the the path is the wrong word they like, they get distracted by this one idea this one thought and they're trying to care for the animal but they have lost track of what's most important which is That's making like sure that you are encouraging its natural behaviors and doing uh, and offering the qualities of its natural environment to it um, so, yeah, I, I get emails from people where they're like, well, you say this, but, like, this doesn't prove anything. And I'm like, okay, take a step back. You need to understand that th we're looking at a bigger picture here. We're not just looking at this one study. We're not just looking at this one sentence within well, this paper. Are relative. You can, you mm -hmm. can do the same study six times and get six different results. Yes. Depending on the type of quantitative Mm -hmm. Yeah, like my favorite uh, one that I bring up a lot is a study that was done in Europe on over 500 bearded dragons. It was a, a retrospective study on just bearded dragon illnesses and uh, what these dragons died from or what they were brought to the vet's office for and what they were diagnosed with and treated with. Really, really interesting stuff. And they found impacted bearded dragons. Okay, that's consistent with, you know, a lot of people's concerns about providing loose substrate to bearded dragons. But it also said that the same bearded dragons who were impacted had other things going on. They had parasites, they had metabolic bone disease, lots of other issues that we know to cause problems in the digestive tract and its function. So with that understanding of how those diseases work, or it doesn't even have to be a thorough understanding, just a basic one of how they work and how they affect an animal's physiology, you get, oh, yes, impaction was a thing, but it wasn't separate. There were other things. It was a symptom of other issues that were going on. And so having that understanding is really critical uh, to finding the right way to care for reptiles. And a lot of people don't have the time or frankly the interest to really dive that deep. So that's what I'm trying to do with reptophiles is I'm diving that deep. I'm going there. I, I love to read, I love to research. Give me all the information, I will absorb it like a sponge. I love it. And sometimes I'm wrong. I love when I'm wrong because that means I get to learn something new and then I tweak the information on reptophiles. But a lot of the time I'm finding out that I'm thinking along the right lines. And my hunches, my intuition based on past research is leading me in the right direction. And so I have to tell people, well, you may not understand, but I do, so trust me. <laughs> and that's, I think that's a, a little bit hard when they see this 26 year old girl and they're like, how? Yeah. <laughs> like you don't have a face. Maybe I need like a really big pair of glasses or something. And just like put my hair up in a ponytail and stop wearing makeup. Maybe then I would be more reputable. I have no idea. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, it's, well, it, it, it's, it's, and here's the thing that I'm learning, like with this hobby and in general, just overall, you know, people really, like they put the heart and soul into it, regardless, most people, you know, they, they want to go with the avenue that they want and then that's what they focus on and to them, that's like you said, that's the best way to do it because sometimes there's that, there's that disconnection between what's the actual right way versus what I'm being told or versus this is what I'm finding. Mm -hmm. And I really like that you pointed out because that is true. That's, uh, that's everywhere. That's everywhere. Yeah. Every aspect of what is it, what's the demographic or so much more. Okay. So, you know, i got to ask you, what's your favorite critter? Of all, My of favorite all, critter? Yeah, your, your favorite reptile <sighs> or amphibian or whatever to work with. What's your all-time favorite species? 
Uh, it comes down to two. Fortunately, people ask me this more often than I'd like to admit, so I have a fairly prepared answer for this. One, morning geckos, Lepidactylus lugubris, is one of my absolute favorites. They are so much fun because, one, they're parthenogenic, so they clone themselves. They're an entirely female species. Um, I hope this is okay to say on your YouTube channel, but <laughs> my coworkers have started referring to them as my lesbian gecko colony. <laughs> because, That's yeah. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Like, these are the... If you're a lesbian, this is the perfect pet for you because you'll get along great. Uh, there's not a man in sight. Males are extremely rare and they're really a genetic mutation that occurs within the species. Wait, so there can be male mm -hmm. lugubrises? Yes. I did not think that was the thing. I thought it was just strictly females. I have seen the pictures with the hemipenes. Oh, yeah. Nature got angry along the way somewhere <laughs> and was like, okay, we're just going to... Well, the funny thing is they developed the ability to uh, reproduce so successfully without males that males became irrelevant and they stopped using them. So uh, take that how you will. <laughs> and then nature was like, well, we don't need you, so we're just going to evolve you out. Basically, that's yeah. That's crazy. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why you see a lot, uh, there's some diversity within uh, morning geckos of how they, they have different appearances. Yep. But they clone, so how on earth do you get different appearances? That's why, because there were males at some point introducing genetic diversity into the species. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. That is what I'm talking about. You are <laughs> chock full of great info. Oh, I, I'm, I'm passionate about them. I love them. I've got a little viv of them in my bedroom, and they just chirp at each other day and night. They I swear they never sleep. More and more. And more. Yeah, it's yeah. really been a journey. But I also, I got to pull this plug as well, or put in this plug. Blue tongue skinks. Taliqua, anything. Love them all. They are wonderful and I'm not much of a, a hoarder of any one species. Like I try to keep it diverse mm -hmm. but that's the ones like trophy species where I want or, or trophy genus I guess where I want every one of every single species as many as I can just have a Taliqua room. These that are my blue tongue cool. skinks. Especially just put them in beautiful enclosures and be like yep this is my collection of living, awesome creatures. They're so much fun. They're really intelligent. Honestly, I think of them as mini tegus. Like, I fostered a tegu for the better part of a year. I'm like, this is no different from having a blue tongue skink, except this one is bigger and messier. That was it. I personally never had tegus, but I've got to, like, work with them on somewhat of a mm -hmm. personal level. And they are, they're like, they are, they are a one-of-a-kind reptile. They, they really, really are. They really are. Like, they, they can almost be trained with offering conditioning. Like mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, it's really, really cool. It's really cool. Yeah, there's a reason why they're such a phenomenon right now. It's just their size, which makes yeah. it, which makes it challenge. So, so, so let me let me ask you something. You know, we have, you know, not digressing from blue tongues because blue tongues are freaking <laughs> awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, but tegus are really up and coming. Yeah. As, as you said, so you, you know, I know you have a big tegu section on your website. Mm -hmm. What's a? How do you prepare somebody with <laughs> an animal like? Oh, man. It's like it's like you know when people buy an iguana, it's not like buying an iguana because that's like night and day, but just a large lizard in mm -hmm. general. Like, you know, is there something that with your with your information platform, a specific type of pack, or you know, a way that you've created that level of awareness to help mm -hmm. spread that this lizard's going to get huge. It's going to need an enormous cage. Are you going to be ready? Yeah, that's something I really try to focus on. Where I don't really talk about uh, juvenile housing anymore. I just talk about adult housing. So you're getting this reptile, this is what size it will need as an adult. Um, for some animals like uh, snakes, sometimes it's good to have uh, a really well outfitted tub or something for when they're babies so that you can out monitor them when they, you know, they're this long and this thin. So there's that. But for a reptile like a tegu or a blue tongue skink, um, bearded dragon, it's, there's no point in not getting the adult enclosure uh, from the onset. They grow quickly and you're going to waste money along the way. That's, 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 that's the main cage. argument that I use. Money, like mm -hmm. Four foot cage, okay, six foot cage, okay. Yeah, it's like Keep just, upgrading. Okay. yeah, if you have to start with the minimum, the reptiles minimum anyway, then fine. 
like we'll start with the minimum and then over time you know you've got 15 20 30 40 years that you're going to be living with this reptile so you can upgrade as you know your finances allow later on down the road but let's make sure that you've got the minimum acceptable size now and, and that you know about this animal that's why i have an introduct an introduction to the species page for every single uh, animal care guide that i have is okay here's where they're from here's some tidbits of information about their habits this is how big they're going to get like this is the basics of what you need to know about this species before you dive into it and for some like um especially the really common ones like bearded dragons, leopard geckos, uh, red-eared sliders. I actually have a disclaimer at the bottom of the first page that says, don't buy one of these if you can avoid it, especially not from a pet store. Instead, buy from a breeder, better yet, adopt. Yeah. Because adopt. we have so many of these animals right now in rescues and on Craigslist, other classifieds, they just need homes. They need loving homes that will take them in. And okay, maybe you'll end up with an adult instead of a baby. Great. Adult reptiles are way easier to keep than baby reptiles are, generally speaking. Yeah. So it's not a big deal for you, and you'll probably get it cheaper, and you're taking pressure off and for these species. Life. You are, absolutely. Most of my animals in my collection right now, I believe, are rehomes. They're at I least all cat, most I of them captive bred. I have a three-toed box jaw. I think it was ran over the lawnmower. His name's Little Stubby. He has oh. three legs. I'll show him to you at some point. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, that's that's great that you have all the all those rescues and all the because the adopting thing. Most people don't think about that. Mm -hmm. They don't think like is that a thing? Let's call adopt. But yeah. it is. It is, guys. And there's totally. If you go on Facebook or Google, just type in reptile adoptions near me. You'll have a lot. Just make sure it's from a registered 5013C. Mm -hmm. And Reptophiles actually has a list of rescues on uh, under our helpful links tab where you can uh, just click one of the links. It'll transport you to the rescues website. And if anyone who's watching, if you have a rescue and yours is not listed, just hit me up at um, reptophiles at gmail.com and I'll have a look into it and hopefully we can get you up on the site because I really want to make this more accessible to people. They don't realize that they can adopt reptiles. One last question. Do you have a listing on your website for reptile veterinarians? I'm working on it. I would like that's it. That's great, because that's something that I want to have for bio too. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think we covered a really good entry thing here. Mariah, we have some really cool videos coming, guys. We're going to be building a terrarium for a rosy boa. We're going to show you guys UVB, different fixtures. We're going to show you guys the solar meter ratings with a bunch of UVB lights. Mm -hmm. A lot of good stuff coming, and uh, I'm also really excited that BioDude is now big time sponsor of reptiles.com. Really, really happy about that. I, I have the link on my website on the bottom. Mariah has, you know, my web page, and mm -hmm. her and I are going to be collectively working together each month on different blog articles, as well as continue to, you know, work with each other on a professional level to keep doing what we do, doing what we love, and you know. You know, if it wasn't for all y'all continuing to support me, I say it every time. Really appreciate all you guys for your continued support of the BioDude. You know, make sure you guys visit my website, you know, BioDude.com. Check, you know, come and come and check out my store. Mariah, right, give them your spiel. My spiel. So, if you haven't ever visited Reptophiles.com before, you're missing out. It's got a database of oh, 16 or more. I'm gonna have to double check that count. Uh, care guides on some of the most common species in the hobby and some less common species depending on my own personal experience and it's growing all the time so go on check it out uh, i have a mailing list so make sure to subscribe to that so you don't miss out aside from care guides i also do product reviews of really cool things so you know what's good and what's bad and i also occasionally go on a rant so that's always fun <laughs> guys thank you so much for everything I really hope you guys enjoyed episode two between the palms. The dude abides.